Hi, I'm Sylvia of ifrsbox.com. I help people simplify IFRS so they can apply the concepts to reduce mistakes and give their career a boost. I have created two courses so far, IFRS in one day, which helps people grasp the basics of IFRS, and the other product is called IFRS Kit, which goes much deeper into the concepts of IFRS. You learn how to apply the rules in everyday situations that most accountants need to learn. If you like this video, I guarantee my courses can help you too. If you're interested, visit ifrsbox.com and see how these valuable courses can make your life easier. Let's now go through the summary of the standard IS-12 on income taxes. This standard has been here for a while, as it was issued in 1979 for the first time, and then it went through certain development until its current form as we know it now. The objective of standard IS-12 is to prescribe the accounting treatment for the income taxes. The principal issue here is to determine how to account for the current and future tax consequences of various transactions and other events of the current periods that are recognized in the financial statements of an entity, and future recovery of carrying amount of assets or settlement of the liabilities in the entity's balance sheet or the statement of the financial position. With regard to tax consequences of various transactions and events in the financial statements, IS-12 makes it easy, because you just need to account for taxes in the same way as for the transaction itself. So if you recognize certain item to profit or loss, then its tax consequence, which is current or deferred income tax, is recognized to profit or loss too. The same applies for the statement of other comprehensive income. If the transaction goes to other comprehensive income, then also its tax consequence goes to other comprehensive income too. So that's easy. IS-12 also guides us in the situation when the future recovery of assets or settlement of liabilities leads to different tax payments in the future than they would be if that recovery or settlement had no tax consequences. Well, speaking simply, what happens if the tax rules are different from the accounting rules? In such a case, an entity is required to recognize deferred tax asset or deferred tax liability, well, with some exceptions. A key element of understanding IS-12 is to understand a difference between accounting profit or loss and taxable profit or loss on one side, and a difference between current income tax and deferred income tax on the other side. So let's start with the accounting profit. For the purpose of this standard, it is defined as a profit or loss for the period before deducting tax expense. Well, be careful and notice that is the profit before tax. Why? To be consistent with the definition of taxable profit or loss, which is the profit or loss for the period determined in accordance with the rules established by the taxation authorities upon which income taxes are payable or recoverable, if applicable. Clearly, as tax rule in your country might vary from accounting rules applied in your company, there will be some differences between these two. Namely, those are expenses recognized but not deductible for tax purposes. For example, non-deductible expenses for business lunch with customers are not allowable for tax purposes in some countries. Then there could be some income not recognized in the financial statements but included in the tax return. For example, some items taxed on a cash basis. Another type of a difference might be expenses not recognized in the financial statements but deductible for tax purposes. Well, similarly, as with interest tax on a cash basis, there could be certain expenses allowable only when you actually pay them. Then there could be income recognized in the financial statements but not included according to tax rules. For example, some government grants received might not be taxable at all. Now, when we have arrived at taxable profit from accounting profit, it's time to explain the basics of current income tax. It is the amount of income taxes payable or recoverable in respect of the taxable profit or tax loss for the period. Income tax payable is calculated as our taxable profit times tax rate. While well, sometimes there could be an income tax recoverable when the entity reached taxable loss instead of taxable profit. Current income tax payable shall almost always be recognized to profit or loss, so the accounting treatment would be to debit expenses in the net profit or loss and credit income tax liability. 
Well, be careful about negative tax or when the taxable profit is in fact loss. Then you should apply rules for tax loss carried forward, which I will talk about a bit later. However, in some cases, current income tax is debited directly to equity or other comprehensive income. For example, when adjusting opening balance of retained earnings resulting from correction of errors. Now, it's time to talk about deferred tax and explain differences between current and deferred taxation. The first difference between current and deferred tax is its substance. While current tax is the actual amount payable to tax authorities in relation to activities in the current period, deferred tax is an accounting measure used to match the tax effect of transactions with their accounting impact and thereby produce less distorted results. Another difference is the basis for calculation of both. Current income tax is calculated from taxable profit, as we have already mentioned, and the basis for calculation of deferred tax is temporary differences between carrying amount and tax base of individual assets and liabilities. Finally, the timing. While current income tax is payable in respect of the current period, deferred tax will be recovered or settled in the future periods in the financial statements. Now, let's summarize the main principles of deferred tax. Deferred tax is an income tax payable or recoverable in future periods with respect of the temporary differences, unused tax losses and unused tax credits. It is calculated as temporary difference times appropriate tax rate. Temporary difference is calculated as carrying amount of an asset or liability less its tax base. And what is a tax base? Tax base of an asset or liability is the amount attributed to that asset or liability for tax purposes. In other words, tax base of an asset is the amount that will be deductible for tax purposes against any taxable economic benefits that will flow to the entity when it recovers the carrying amount of the asset. Well, let me tell you the example. Imagine you have an interest receivable of 1000 in your accounts. If the interest received is taxable on cash basis, interest receivable has a tax base equal to zero. Tax base of liability is its carrying amount, less any amount that will be deductible for tax purposes in respect of the liability in future periods. For example, when accrued expenses are taxed on a cash basis, then related liability has a tax base equal to zero. Moreover, there could be some items that are not recognized as assets or liabilities in the statement of financial position and still do have a tax base. For example, research expenses that were recognized in profit or loss in the period in which they were incurred, but tax law did not permit them as a deduction until later period. Once you understand the concept of a tax base, we can compute temporary differences. Temporary difference is simply carrying amount of an asset or liability less its tax base. When carrying amount exceeds a tax base, then it is a taxable temporary difference and it gives rise to deferred tax liability. On the other hand, when carrying amount of an asset or liability is lower than its tax base, then it is a deductible temporary difference and it gives rise to deferred tax asset. Now let me add to this that there could be one more circumstance giving rise to deferred tax asset. When an entity has unused tax losses or tax credits that could be carried forward, then deferred tax asset might be recognized to the extent that it is probable that future taxable profit will be available against which the unused tax losses and unused tax credits can be utilized. Now, let's take a look to some examples of taxable temporary differences. Large group of taxable temporary differences represents timing differences. They are called timing because the recognition of certain item in the financial statements occurs in a different time than its recognition in tax return. Typical example of timing temporary differences is interest revenue included in accounting when occurred, but taxed when cash is received. Taxable temporary differences might arise at business combinations. When identifiable assets and liabilities are revalued upwards to the fair value at the acquisition date, but no adjustment is made for tax purposes. The same situation might happen when an entity applies a policy of revaluation of assets to fair value in its individual financial statements. Also, when an asset or liability are initially recognized in the financial statements, a part or all of it could be tax non-deductible or not taxable. 
In this case, deferred tax liability is recognized based on the specific situation. Well, no matter where the taxable temporary difference arose, an entity shall recognize deferred tax liability for all of them except for three cases. No deferred tax liability is recognized from initial recognition of goodwill. No deferred tax liability is recognized in a transaction that is not a business combination and affects neither accounting nor taxable profit. And also, no deferred tax liability on liabilities arising from undistributed profits from investments where the entity is able to control the timing of the reversal of the difference and it is probable that the reversal will not occur in the foreseeable future. Now, let's take a look to deductible temporary differences that give rise to a deferred tax asset. So, Timing differences arise when a liability is recognized in one period but allowed to be deducted for tax purposes in another period. For example, healthcare liabilities could be tax deductible when benefits are paid to employees, but liabilities should be recognized when employees render the service. Then business combinations when identifiable assets or liabilities are revalued downwards to fair value at the acquisition date, but no adjustment is made for tax purposes. The same situation might happen when an entity applies a policy of revaluation of assets to fair value in its individual financial statements and resulting fair value is lower than assets tax base. Also, when an asset or liability are initially recognized in the financial statements, part or all of it could be tax non-deductible or taxable. In this case, deferred tax asset is recognized. No matter where the deductible temporary difference arose, an entity shall recognize deferred tax assets to the extent that it is probable that taxable profit will be available against which the deductible temporary difference can be utilized. With regard to measurement of current tax liabilities, we have already learned that those should be measured at amount expected to be paid to tax authorities using appropriate tax rate enacted by the end of the reporting period. How is it with the deferred tax? What tax rate shall be used? Well, in measuring deferred tax, tax rate expected to apply in the period of settlement or recovery shall be used, but based on tax rate that have been enacted or substantively enacted by the end of the reporting period, so no estimates. Sometimes different tax rates apply for different types of transactions, and the measurement of deferred tax liabilities and deferred tax assets shall reflect the tax consequences that would follow from the manner in which the entity expects to recover or settle the carrying amount of its assets and liabilities. Finally, I want you to remember that neither deferred tax assets nor deferred tax liabilities shall be discounted. The reason is that discounting would require detailed scheduling of timing or reversal of each temporary difference which is time-consuming and impracticable and often produces different results within different companies. IS-12 also sets rules for deferred tax related to investments in subsidiaries, associates and joint ventures and specifically in parent and group accounts. Now, let's talk about where to recognize deferred tax. Under the most circumstances, deferred tax is recognized as an expense or income in the profit or loss for the period. However, there are a few exceptions. When we deal with the transaction or even that was in the current period recognized outside profit or loss, for example directly in equity or in other comprehensive income. Deferred tax arising from such a transaction is recorded exactly in the same place as transaction itself. So what items are recognized in other comprehensive income? For example, when you apply revaluation model according to IS 16 and account for revaluation surpluses to other comprehensive income. And what do we normally account directly to equity or accumulated profit or loss? When you correct the errors from previous reporting periods directly to equity or when you apply change in accounting policy retrospectively. Another specific situation with deferred taxes arises at business combinations. Well, when investor acquires some other company, deferred tax assets or liabilities shall be recognized. In this case, deferred tax affects the amount of goodwill or bargain purchase gain of investor. However, no deferred tax liability shall be recognized on initial recognition of goodwill. Now, let's talk about presentation and disclosures related to deferred tax. 
The main issue of the presentation of different taxes in the financial statements is offsetting, or whether tax assets and tax liabilities arising from different temporary differences of the same entity might be presented as one net amount. Well, with regard to current income tax, an entity might offset assets and liabilities when two conditions are fulfilled. The first one is that an entity must have a legally enforceable right to set off the recognized amount. In most cases, this condition is fulfilled when the taxes are levied by the same tax authority who agree to settle it in a net basis. The second condition is that an entity intends either to settle on a net basis or to realize the asset and settle the liability simultaneously. With regard to deferred income taxes, the entity can recognize the net amount only when it has a legally enforceable right to set off current tax assets against current tax liabilities, and we have just said when it happens. But also, deferred tax asset and deferred tax liability must relate to income taxes levied by the same taxation authority or the same entity. So just be careful when preparing consolidating financial statements and combining parents and subsidiaries deferred taxations. They cannot be offset. IAS 12 requires to present a number of disclosures related to income taxes. For example, major components of tax shall be disclosed separately. Amount of income tax relating and charged directly to equity and statement of other comprehensive income. Explanation of changes in tax rates and other. So that was a short summary of IAS 12. I appreciate you watching the video and I trust you learned a lot. If you or one of your colleagues or friends want to take your IFRS knowledge a little deeper, check out a sample of the course IFRS in one day by signing up for email updates at ifrsbox.com. You'll also receive the ebook top 7 IFRS mistake that you should avoid. You'll be joining thousands of other accountants who have benefited from my courses. Thanks again and have a nice day.